What's up everyone, Sean Count Blackearth here today with an album review. This time of the 2002, the end records release of The Mantle by Agalock. This review was a request by Drew Loy over on my Patreon. He's part of the $10 a month tier and he requested for me to review for a classic album, The Mantle. And I am so glad he did because this is... A very, very, very micrometer close second place as my favorite album of all time. With Agalock to describe them with one particular genre or to give them any real genre tag is kind of a disservice to Agalock. To me, they are much more than just black metal, just folk metal, just whatever you want to use to describe them post-black metal, to me they're much more than that. And to try to pigeonhole them into one sound or say, if you like black metal, you'll like Agalock, is a severe disservice to Agalock for the extreme diversity of their entire body of work, and more specifically, this album and how it embodies everything that Agalock has always been about. And unfortunately, since they broke up, this is really the ultimate testament to what Agalock truly is, in my opinion. Due to the success of their first album, Pale Folklore, which you could almost see as a homage and almost a love letter to the debut Over album in many regards, Agalock took a huge step in a direction that in my opinion, was not only the right direction, but the direction that would solidify the Agalock sound and make them known for being the band that they are known as, which is this incredibly diverse, absolutely beautiful, melancholic, atmospheric music. And the embodiment of that within this album is just absolutely fantastic. And because of the success of Pale Folklore, they were able to create a much larger, more expansive record than anything that Pale Folklore could have even imagined. This album is truly a journey. It's an album that you can't listen to just one song here, one song there. You need to truly sit down and listen to this because this album is a cinematic experience of just absolute beauty and the desolation of a cold winter. To me, this is an album that you throw on when you're snowed in. When there's so much snow, you can't leave your house. It's blistering cold outside, but you have the heat on inside. You're nice and warm, but you can see the cruel, harsh coldness of winter outside your window. This is the album for you. Now, the great thing about this album is it's essentially centered around musically the idea of three chords and you hear these three chords in different variations different strumming patterns and even different not necessarily chords but the same tonality of those chords throughout the entire record and it's immediately placed in front of you on the very first song celebration for the death of man Celebration for a Death of Man is an acoustic folk sort of intro with some atmospheric guitars in the background and very minimal percussion with the repetitive three chords playing over and over. Now, on paper, with the way I'm describing it, it may sound like it's a boring sort of intro and that could be further from the truth because these chords are absolutely gorgeous. That's the genius thing about this album in many ways, is a lot of the ideas of this album and a lot of what this album does on paper makes it sound like this album would be a total train wreck, but it truly is far from that. And let me explain. Not only with this intro do you get this beautiful atmosphere and this tone set forth, it leads perfectly into the 14 plus minute epic in the shadow of our pale companion which for many people is the ultimate Agalock song. It is their anthem to many people, and I fall into that category. It's one of the greatest songs ever written, period. And it's such a great start to the album. 
And usually if a band starts off with like their best song right at the beginning of the record, it makes the whole album feel less um less grand, so to speak, than that previous track. That's not the case with this. The pure magic of this song only sets forth what you're going to hear for the rest of the album. It goes through many different changes. There's many different moods. There's many different sounds too in the shadow of our pale companion between the acoustic guitars which really are the focal point and the driving point of this album to these absolutely gorgeous guitar effects that are laid throughout this entire album with the electric guitar and the distortion being sort of in the background to kind of keep an atmosphere to it while letting the acoustic drive it you have all of that plus the absolutely fantastic vocals of John Hom, where he has this sort of whispery, throaty rasp that I absolutely love. And to me, it truly has this cold sound to his voice where it has the harshness of winter and it has that whispery, almost wind-like sound. And to me, that's absolutely beautiful. Plus the monotone singing when I say monotone, I don't mean that in a bad way, how I usually would when I say something's very monotone. His, there's not much variation to his clean vocals, but it adds to the total sorrow of this song, and not just this song, this entire album. You have these absolutely beautiful lyrics with this gorgeous music, and it's painting this utterly beautiful landscape, and I keep using the word beautiful over and over again because it's honestly one of the only words I can use to describe the magic of this song. One of my favorite lines ever in music is in this song, which is, here at the edge of this world, here I gaze at a pantheon of oak and a citadel of stone. If this grand panorama before me is what you call God, then God is not dead. And that, to me, being someone that absolutely loves being outside in nature, being going up on a mountain or walking through the forest and just seeing the pure beauty of what nature has to offer. And to me, that line just says, the beauty of God is the beauty of nature. It is a reflection of both. And to me, that is one of the most powerful fucking lyrics ever written. And I absolutely worship this song. As the song progresses, there's tons of guitar effects that pan left to right with vocals that are actually whispers on one side, spoken word on the other, and it creates this almost surround sound-like effect. And that's something that's utilized a couple times throughout this album, and it's absolutely amazing how it's done. And as the song progresses, it builds into potentially one of my favorite guitar solos of all time. That starts off with a very quick sweep and one of the most emotional and beautiful solos ever written. Not just in metal, but in music in general. Don Anderson is my favorite guitarist for a reason. And that solo is the prime example of what I love about his guitar playing. Is He's extremely talented and he can utilize that talent in a minimal, minimalistic sort of fashion. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. Then you have songs like Odal, which are a much more just a guitar-based um, ambience sort of uh, interlude to the album. It's definitely its own piece, and I would say calling it an interlude is discounting its impact. But it definitely has this sort of interlude sort of vibe to it that I absolutely, truly love. One of the cool things about this is the ambient guitars and how they kind of wash in and out of this absolutely fantastic production and the way it just builds and builds and how it flows perfectly into the next song, which is I Am The Wooden Doors. I Am The Wooden Doors is one of those sort of songs that just really brings to mind the previous album, Pale Folklore, and the first Ulver record. Even the drum fill at the beginning sounds just like Ulver. And I really like that. It's still a black metal song. It's still an atmospheric black metal song. But once again, the acoustics and the, the acoustic guitars and the vocals 
with the range from being the sort of throaty, whispery screams to the monotone queen singing, it creates its own unique atmosphere that is different from Ulver. To me, Ulver's Bertha is much more of a summery sort of atmosphere, whereas this is just pure cold winter atmosphere. And speaking of winter atmosphere, that leads us to The Lodge. The Lodge is an instrumental track on this album that is based around a very simplistic acoustic guitar piece that carries throughout the entire song. And it starts off absolutely beautifully with just a quick guitar strum and a deer antler being hit upon, I believe, a deer skull. And it has this very unique echo and this unique tone to it. And the way it echoes throughout the track and then you hear footprints in deep snow. It's absolutely beautiful as how the guitars come in and you have this very repetitive guitar with this wash of guitar, of lead guitar effects coming in very subtly over it along with contrabass and just creating this super dense atmosphere that you can just get lost in. And the way it perfectly leads into You Are But A Ghost In My Arms is absolutely genius. You Are But A Ghost In My Arms is another example of Agalock at their best when it comes to the atmospheric black metal sound. While there's nothing that's blistering fast, there's nothing that is abrasive about it, it still retains that pale folklore quality that I love so much out of this band. And it retains that acoustically driven sound that is very present on this album. There's absolutely nothing about it that feels out of place. And I think the song is just absolutely fantastic. And once again, the flow of the album is absolutely perfect because it leads into the Hawthorne Passage, which for the longest time, The Lodge was my favorite instrumental on this album. But as the years have passed, the Hawthorne Passage has became probably my favorite instrumental of all time. It is this absolutely genius, I believe, 11 minute piece of music that has a few different passages in it. Uh, the first half is very melancholic sounding. It's very dark, it's very depressing, and it's very beautiful at the same time. With these absolutely beautiful lead guitar pieces that carry throughout that have this bluesy sort of vibe to it, which is a very unique idea to incorporate a bluesy guitar type of soloing in with a atmospheric and folky black metal sort of record. And it works extremely well. And honestly, it's one of my favorite moments on here. And then from there, the song just builds up into this more upbeat section that has almost a western sort of vibe to it and it's once again an example of how on paper mixing western music in with this makes absolutely no sense in many ways but it is executed so well and there are so many things that are on this record that just feel like how could this even work but when you hear it it's utilized so well that you can't help but just sit back and almost applaud them for not only having the balls to do it, but to actually make it work. Now the second part of the Hawthorne Passage comes in, and basically what bridges that is actually a sample of the Hawthorne Bridge, which I believe is in Portland, Oregon. There is a sample uh, taken from underneath the bridge, and you hear the cars passing overhead and metal clanking from the tires driving up onto it. And it's something that's very subtle that actually doesn't detract from the very nature sort of atmosphere. In many ways, it just sounds like wind blowing. And I love that. And it's utilized so well that it's just absolutely gorgeous. And how it leads into this much more upbeat section is very cool. And along with the samples taken from some Swedish movie, I couldn't tell you what the samples mean. I couldn't tell you what movie it's from for some reason i did not research that before i recorded this which was kind of dumb on my behalf it just adds to the super unique atmosphere and how the song ends is with a sample of a man speaking in swedish and it leads absolutely perfectly into the and the great cold death of the earth now this is where the album sort of comes full circle 
Celebration for the death of man and the great cold death of the earth are tied together not only by their title, but the usage of the chords within the intro. They are brought back as the outro to this song, which I think is an absolutely brilliant idea. And I just love the flow of this song. I love the simplicity at many points of it. How there's an acoustic guitar solo going over the electric guitars in the background, once again pushing this sort of neo-folk sound forward even more. And once again, lyrically, absolutely beautiful. Life is a clay urn on the mantle and I am shattered on the floor. Extremely powerful lyrics. There's, uh, I believe, the section that is uh, screamed or growled or however you would describe John's vocals is actually taken from a Cherokee legend, if I remember correctly. Let me double check that. And it's Cherokee folklore, so I was technically correct. As I said, the song goes through many waves and many passages, and all of them work perfectly. And it ends with the intro to the album. And now, this is where, for a f the first, like, maybe ten times I listened to it, the fact that the album didn't end with And the Great Cold Death of the Earth was kind of puzzling to me. But now it makes sense. And here's why. The last track is A Desolation Song. And A Desolation Song is a purely acoustic folk sort of song written by Don Anderson. Uh, and it features accordion, contrabass, acoustic guitars, and mandolin. And what essentially comes down to being spoken word and the way this works is it creates this extremely as the title implies this very desolate sound so essentially you have met the end of your trip this whole album i view as being a journey and the desolate and the destination is a completely desolate place and it's a place that you go to almost mourn in a way and you definitely get a sense of that from the lyrics of it. And once again, the attention to detail that Agalock has is absolutely impeccable. And in my opinion, nobody has ever really fully touched that level of detail that they did with this album. Once when you think the song's over, it's not. It has this sort of acoustic guitar solo sort of piece at the end, but it doesn't feel forced or shoehorned in. And the very last thing you hear, not only in this song, but on this album, is the sound of the antler hitting the deer skull. Once again, I could be incorrect about the skull. I know the antler is correct. Which is something that they brought back from the incredibly beautiful interlude, or instrumental, I should say, The Lodge. So the final thing you hear is the echo of the antler, and the album is over, and your journey is over. And the way I view it is, if you don't feel at least emotionally moved in one way or another by this journey, I can't fully trust you as a human being. This album is probably one of the most human albums ever made. And it's, a, it's the work of genius. There is no way around it. This is a genius record. And... It's one of those albums I feel like every single person needs to hear at least once before they die. And one thing that I can't, I could not do a review on this album without mentioning how absolutely stellar the production is. To me, this is probably the best production I've ever heard in my life. It, it sounds so natural and there's this natural warmth coming in from this record in all directions that every single time I listen to it, I feel something inside me just melt. It's the only way I can describe it. I get chills every time I listen to this album. And the production is a huge factor into this. The mixing, the mastering is just absolutely perfect. And I've listened to, I have the original version uh, released in 2002, which I bought by total blind buy and almost mistake and it sounds absolutely fantastic there is a remastered version which i also have as well this is the original 
And I was actually lucky enough to uh, interview and meet them. And I did get this signed by uh, the rest of the band. Um, and the original master sounds fantastic, but the remaster vinyl pressing is just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, the low end on this is just fantastic, and I feel like part of the reason why they may have wanted to remaster it, and I'm not 100% sure on this, is when they originally recorded this, uh, it was part of my interview when I asked them about uh, recording analog this album was half analog, half digital. The studio converted halfway through. So the drums, I believe, are analog. And analog drums versus digital drums, some people say there's no difference. In my opinion, at least with this type of music, there's a huge difference. It sounds absolutely gorgeous. And this remaster sounds fantastic. And if you see a copy, definitely pick one up. Gatefold, double vinyl. The happiest man is he who learns from nature the lesson of worship. R. W. Emerson. And the vinyl version does come with a booklet. The full lyrics, credits, all that good shit. Uh, if you will, fuck man, I don't. Even, I'm starting to get at a loss for words because. I love this album so much. If you want a copy, pick up a copy. The vinyl, I think, is starting to become harder to find. The CD is pretty easy. I recommend getting it any way you possibly can. Preferably vinyl, because I feel like this is an album that truly should be experienced on vinyl. But the fact that the CD gives you zero interruptions kind of helps for the journey aspect of this record. For a score, this is a 10 out of 10 album. I can't recommend it enough to anybody that's into any sort of atmospheric music. And uh, with all that said, um, thank you once again to Drew for being my patron and everyone else who is a patron over on my Patreon. Link will be down below if you're interested. And uh, that's all I got to say today. Um, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And I'll see you in the next video.